Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from Safeddeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, Safeddeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June, and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course, and if you do it before September 20th, you'll get a 20% discount. Go to safeddean.com and sign up now. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to this show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for Crowd Health and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the Sats card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard Sats card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin standard podcast. Today's seminar, we resume the conversation we had in the last seminar two days ago with Michael Saylor and Patrick Newman on Murray Rothbard's book conceived in Liberty, which discusses American colonial history. So, uh, we had a pretty, uh, full conversation over the last two days. We've released it, um, uh, uh on Twitter, pretty positive feedback. Got a lot of feedback from people who enjoyed it. They really enjoyed the crossover, watching Michael Saylor delve into Austrian economics. I, it did not disappoint as uh, as many had expected. And uh, we left behind quite a bit of topics that we wanted to talk about. So some of the things that we want to have on the agenda today is to assess the revolution in terms of its impact on freedom and to discuss the economics of the colonial era. Uh, something Michael wanted to talk about. So I guess um, we could maybe be kick off with where I left off last time, which is the uh, highly controversial claim I made, which is maybe things would have been better off without the revolution. And uh, the case for that I, um, I made last time is, you know, if you look at uh, the thing that people revolted around about in the US at that time, it was a tax on tea which was around 1.5% or 2% or something like that. Well, today the average American pays something like 30, 40, 50% on their income. They pay money, they pay taxes on their inheritance. They pay taxes when they buy a house. They pay, ta they pay taxes pretty much every time they do anything. And um, I guess there's the, uh, the case here could be made that um, the fact that you got rid of the king uh, exacerbated this problem and was bad for freedom on two fronts. On the one hand, um, when you have a government that goes around claiming to be legitimately representing you for your freedom, it gains a lot of popularity, which allows it a lot more power to go and impose these kind of taxes. And so this kind of thing can help governments grow rather than restrain them when they um, peddle these ideals of liberty and freedom and when they tell you that they're not a king and they, they're not uh, going to give the uh, rule and uh, to their children after they're done, uh, 
that gives them a sort of legitimacy, which is actually counterproductive because people think, oh, well, it's a legitimate government that represents us. So then let them go ahead and uh, charge us as much as they want. And the second aspect is the fact that, uh, you know, when, uh, and also, well, related to that is the aspect of it being local. It's American. They're Americans like us. They're not Europeans. They're not British. And then this emergence of a new American identity as opposed to British identity was capitalized on quite successfully by the new government, which managed to impose all these taxes. And the other point is that, um, I, which, which, which is what I said last time is, you know, you get rid of a king, you think that that is going to necessarily result in freedom, but it seems that what happens is that you just end up with endless conflicts between thousands of little mini kings who all have a very brief period in which they're going to be king, four years, maybe eight years, and therefore they are incentivized to maximize the amount of power and money that they can get during that period. Whereas when you have a, an actual king who's been there for 10 generations and expects to be there for another 10 generations, that king has a vested interest in your grandchildren and great, great, great grandchildren being around, being uh, healthy and wealthy enough for his great, great, great grandchildren to be able to tax successfully. So that actually creates incentive alignment when you have a long-term king because he wants you to prosper for the long term and you want to prosper for the long term. And so that might even be better for freedom. I will concede, though, of course, the strongest counter argument, this is looking at the state of Britain today. And it's not clear that their monarchy has worked out very well for them. So that's a very powerful counter argument, which I'm going to um, <laughs> submit to myself before allowing you the pleasure of uh, uh, <laughs> rubbing it in my face. But what are your thoughts on this? Was the American Revolution a big mistake? Well, um, I, there's so much there to discuss. Um, I, if we abstract to the to the first subject, monarchy and the best form of government, I, I'm of the opinion that uh, government via natural protocol, uh, natural objective rational protocol is the best. And that, that's what Bitcoin is, right? The way that trees grow and the way that fish swim and the way the birds fly and the way that nature evolves is the best governance protocol. But the second best uh, governance protocol, in my opinion, is a systemic meritocracy based on charter or constitution, if you can, uh, with checks and balances, term limits, a continual electoral or merit-based process that replaces the leadership. I mean, the reason I, I think that, I mean, that, by the way, is that's the conclusion of the founding fathers, right? They gave us a constitution, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, franchise, uh, broadly distributed, right? And, um, and uh, a system to appoint leaders over time. If I compare two situations uh, and the incentives and I'll, we'll talk about monarchy for a second. I'm going to base my comments on a reading of, you know, Will Durant's Oriental Heritage, a thousand pages of history of Oriental monarchies, followed by the Greek experiment by Will Durant, another thousand pages, followed by the history of Rome and Christ, another thousand pages, followed by the Age of Faith, another 1,500 pages or something, followed by all these other histories. And I think probably there's a thousand stories of monarchies and, you know, and here's the way it oftentimes evolves. There's a good monarch. They claim a lot of territory. They get married. They want sons. They don't get them. The kingdom devolves into civil war. Okay. Or there's a good monarch. They get married. They have sons, a bunch of sons like William the Conqueror, like Philip of Macedon, et cetera. And then uh, they go off to fight, and then their brother-in-law starts to whisper in the ear of the 12-year-old kid, you know, your father's never going to give you the throne, or he's never going to give you the kingdom, and so you need to depose him. And so you end up with the father fighting the son, or you end up with, you know, like, how, how do you corrupt a 12-year-old kid, right? You give them sex, drugs, alcohol, power, or you just get in their head. And so in a hereditary monarchy, you end up with endless intrigue, and the only way you do a recall is assassination. So you end up with endless assassinations, and you end up with the younger brother 
killing the older brother because he thinks the older brother is going to kill him when he ascends, or you end up with the older brother killing brothers two, three, four, and five, and then you end up with three wives and the concubine, and the concubine poisons the second wife, the first three sons, and uh, promotes her son. And if, you know, if you're William the Conqueror, you go off and you conquer the UK, and then the French lords in the background intrigue with your oldest son. And, you know, William the Conqueror, the great man he was, died fighting his own son, right? Right? Philip the Macedon's first son uh, killed the second son. And, you know, there, history is full of examples where what generally happens is if you're lucky, you have a peaceful succession and the guy's mediocre. And then by the third generation, the king's awful. But very often what happens is, and this is, this is, uh, it's too much temptation. It's someone wants power. One of your feudal lords wants power. You're busy running the nation. He goes and finds your eight year old daughter, eight year old son, murders three other kids, has a kid with that one and elevates them or your ex-wife or your second wife murders you in favor of your eight-year-old son, and then she rules as regent with her lover, who is the head of the palace guard. So, so there's, I, I could give you a thousand examples, right? In, in Greek history, Byzantine history, Persian history, every history, Chinese history, it goes on and on. And on. So the problem with monarchy is you end up with endless intrigue and assassination, civil assassination, civil war, mediocrity, and centralization. And let's take the other extreme, a perfect meritocracy. Now, this we're not. There's no government like this. Can I before we move to that? Mind if I interrupt and just uh, yeah. respond to this point? Yeah, go I'll, ahead. I'll I'll make a couple of counterpoints. The first of all is these are the hazards of the job. This is why most people shouldn't be king. This is why most people have no business okay. being in that business. And this is why, actually, as a subject of a monarchy, I'm glad that this stuff gets uh, sorted out in palace intrigue between, you know, uncles and siblings and brothers and lovers and uh, cheaters. You know, they all kill each other, and I'm just going to pledge allegiance to whoever comes out on top. And my day-to-day -day life is unaffected. Democracy brings that conflict into every household in the country because everybody is king. Everybody is uh, responsible for choosing the king. Everybody becomes involved. And you see you see the, how this becomes more and more dangerous. Okay, if, if they're civilized enough just to poison each other, then you're right. But, but the truth is, generally, they raise a 100,000-person army each, and then you end up with 147,000 plebs dead on the battlefield while the two brothers duke it out. And so, you know, if you look at Rome, it was destroyed by civil war. So th these things aren't normally decided by a single knife. They're nor they normally end up with armies taking the field, and there are lots and lots of innocent people that are caught between brother one and brother two. Yeah, but I mean, the bloodshed of monarchies absolutely pales in comparison to what democracies have done in just one century. So the, 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 there's a very big difference there that monarchies at the end of the day. But now you've got a bias. You're only looking at the last hundred years with modern weapons. And because that's the hundred years of democracy. Okay, but you've got 10,000 years of history of monarch monarchy driven strife and so if they had atomic weapons yeah if if they had atomic weapons 2000 years ago maybe we wouldn't be here because brother number 4 would have nuked brother number 2 and 3 you know so i i think that one one issue is how how much damage does technology do but the other issue is how much damage does hereditary monarchy do yeah and i think you know i, I get your point but 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 also there's 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 a um, sampling bias here wherein you know we need that we read the headlines of history which are the bloodshed and the brother killing his brother or killing his son or whatever and we you know the history that there's no headlines about all the hundreds and thousands of years of peace that uh, intervened there and my my favorite counterpoint to this is looking at the Japanese monarchy it's been in power for two thousand and six hundred years. That's not worked out too badly for the Japanese people. In fact, that's a liberal that, that's a liberal narrative and fairly simplistic. The truth is, you know, the shoguns were killing each other, and the and the the hereditary monarch didn't have the power. That's why the, it's lasted that long. The power has shifted to lots of other individuals over that time period that were engaging in a whole lot of murder. Yeah, but it's still two thousand and six hundred years. That's no joke.
But the only reason it's lasted is because the emperor doesn't have the power, <laughs> right? If you, if mean, you look at, like the emperor who didn't have the power in World War II, the emperor who didn't have the power during, the, during all the shogunates, right? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the emperor exercising power over the government. It was, it, it was a, a, a ceremonial figurehead, and there are a lot of other people behind the scenes that were doing the killing. Perhaps, but I think, I mean, I think uh, maybe this underestimates the role of the monarch because I think look at look at this observation across Europe and across the Arab world. I've noticed all the countries that have monarchies never developed uh, any kind of leader like Hitler or Mussolini or uh, Saddam Hussein or these massive mass murdering. I don't, I don't think that's true. I mean, that Genghis, Genghis Khan murdered like half of Asia. That's true, but not, not his own people. And he was a king and, and his sons inherited power. I mean, I, yeah. I think that you're whitewashing history. I think that there are 10,000 examples of civil wars where one brother, you know, fought with another one and 100,000 or 10,000 or 50,000 innocent people died, you know, in the middle. They just didn't record them because it goes back so long. Let, let me approach this a different way. Let's think about the incentives. If you take the U.S. Navy, for example, and you say, well, we're going to let 18-year-olds all join the Navy. They're going to go through four years of training as a cadet. Then they're going to work for 20 years. We're going to weed out the misfits. We're going to weed out the incompetents that can't drive the ship. Anyone that beaches the boat gets cut. And then we're going to promote the really talented ones who have the respect of, of their crew and of their subordinates to the rank of captain. And then at age 40, we're going to pick someone between 40 and 45 to be admiral. And everyone in the society, every eight-year-old kid knows that they could actually join the Navy and they may actually rise to be admiral. And everybody in the Navy knows that you know every officer has a shot through merit to rise up to the top. And so you have this pyramid and you're creating aligned interest where the interest of hundreds of thousands or millions of people are all aimed at living a life of merit and modesty, humility, service, and competence so as to achieve success. That meritocracy with a system attached to it, you know, creates a pyramid and the likelihood that you have a, a uh, egotistical, arrogant idiot running the entire Navy at age 45 or 50 is very low because you can't fool 100,000 people and, and move through 10,000 tests of virtue to get there. But on the other hand, when you actually appoint your 12-year-old son or your six-year-old son and you say, one day, kid, you'll control the entire empire, the kid's going to be corrupted by women, palace courtiers, by alcohol, by infinite power, and, and by your political enemies behind your back who are scheming for the 30 years to get under the kid's skin. And there aren't very many six-year-olds that actually have the maturity to resist infinite power and infinite corrupting influences coming at them from every direction. So by the time you're 45, you might actually have the maturity to defend yourself before you're given infinite power. And at age four, Obviously, you don't. So, the, so the, the real, my real beef with a hereditary monarchy is the four-year-old kid or the 12-year-old kid is not going to be able to fight off all of the vices and corrupting influences of the world when they haven't had a life of education and a set of virtuous uh, drivers to, to toughen them up. And I think we, we have lots of examples where like during the age of the Antonines, right? When, when they adopted a 40-year-old or appointed a 40-year-old military person as emperor, gener like a Hadrian or a Trajan or an Antoninus, they generally did an okay job. When you got to Marcus Aurelius, he got adopted as a teenager into the emperor's court or younger. He was a bit corrupted. And then when he actually adopted or when he appointed Commodus, who was his teenage son as the emperor, life went to hell. And out of the next hundred emperors, most of them died of assassination and it was just chaos in the empire. Your best argument is it's hard to establish a systemic meritocracy, right? It's, I'm, not, I'm not just going to say it's hard. I think, you know, you just look at the current head of your meritocracy in your country. It's a child sniffing 70-year-old 
pedophile who goes out and sniffs children up on TV and everybody just claps along and pretends that this is normal. I think, uh, you know, on, in theory, it seems like it's a meritocracy, but in reality, it ends up being an oligopoly. And the reality is that because there's no security of property rights for the king in uh, his rule for generations, then you end up with a very high time preference oligopoly that's in charge for a few people. Safe, of- safe. There's no security for kings ever in history, right? I mean, it's a lot more secure than than, than presidents who expect to be out in a few few four years. Something like the majority of them die a violent death, right? For even during this time period, it's in. The ma- the majority of the ones that you read about in all of these palace intrigue stories, but the reality is the vast majority of transitions are normal, peaceful. The kid grows up, and when he's in his 20s and 30s, his dad hands over the reins, and then he takes up. Maybe that's a 20th century view of the monarchs with no power, but that's not the view of history. Let's, I mean, let's take this, right? The, we had the, in 1640, during this period, you had a, par- a civil war in England, and Cromwell deposed you know, the king of England. And then you ended up with the glorious revolution coming 1688 again. And so so you never really had a monarchy with absolute power at this point. It was destabilized. And one could argue that the reason that the British colonists actually defeated the Spanish and the French is because the British government had more checks and balances. The monarchy was actually undermined by parliament and by the aristocrats and by British common law. And there were checks on what you could do, uh, you know, as the king. Uh, absolute power without a uh, charter. I mean, like the British didn't have absolute power after the Magna Carta, right? I mean, so so absolute power generally corrupts absolutely. And We have a lot of examples in this book, if we bring it back to Conceived in Liberty, that are fascinating, like the behavior of Governor Berkeley in Virginia. When uh, uh, Berkeley shows up and he starts to issue land to his cronies via fiat, and uh, then then he starts to seize property via fiat, and then they deny people free speech, and then they tax them, and he ends up with a rebellion you know, Bacon's rebellion and he, and he fights the rebellion. And then eventually the heads, the rebels all die. And then Berkeley goes on a reign of terror and he starts hanging everybody in the colony. And he probably would have killed them all until the King of England is the moderating influence. So Charles II, you know, basically pardons everybody and sends a note to give them back their property, trying to deescalate. Berkeley intercepts the message buries the message, kills everybody anyway, <laughs> seizes all their property, right? And, uh, and leading Charles to make this quote, which is, I think, uh, you know, uh, iconic quote and worthwhile to point out, which is Charles II, I guess a king you would have liked. He says, that old fool has hanged more men in that naked country than I did here for the murder of my father, period. Okay, so first of all, in my defense, Charles's father does get killed. <laughs> so, second, Charles does come back to power after the collapse of Parliament. Third, Charles appears to have been a, a you know fairly rational guy, and you have an example of a rational guy that wants to de-escalate. But and here, here the enemy is distance, the amount of time, you know, the logistics. It takes a long time to send a message, and uh, it's very difficult to enforce your will. So the fact that you had a fiat government able to take, you know, unilateral actions, including matters of life or death, um, that was distant from a check or a balance, right? He, Berkeley was, in essence, uh, a terrorized, a tyrant. Charles wasn't even a tyrant, right? Charles knew at the end of the day, what, why? Because his father had been killed for going too far, and the parliament exactly. was there. That's but, but that's what a king is. He's got a long term view on this. You know, well that that would be an executive branch, a legislative branch, you know, a, a legal branch or a judicial branch, and a charter or a, a, a system of laws. And when you have people working in that system, everybody knows that if they go too far, their head's going to get chopped off, right? And so, you could say through this period, what's interesting is, and. In, Many examples where the British king wouldn't impose taxes on his own people or wouldn't impose certain restrictions on his own people, but the governor of the colony 
say, North Carolina or Virginia or Maryland ended up aggrandizing more power and inflicting more uh, tyranny on the people than would have taken place, you know, in the middle of London. And so you had these extremes that were going on. I, I think this is honestly so, uh, an argument in support of my perspective, which is that Charles had a much lower time preference. He thought about things longer term, whereas Berkeley was just your average democratic leader who gets into power and is trying to maximize power as much as he can. And then, you know, this is this is the Stalin mode, the Saddam mode. It was just- not, not average democratic leader. Average democratic leaders don't get the ability to hang everyone they disagree with and steal their property. <laughs> Right. So if the, if the mayor had the ability to steal your land, shoot you in the head and jail you for objecting, then that would be equivalent to these governors. Right. They, they were much more than than, quote, average Democratic leader. And I, th- I, and I, I mean, you know, there's an argument to be made that it, if you look at the modern era. Right. When's the last time we had a civil war or a military uprising in the United States? And, you, you know, and, and the answer is. It's been a while, and one of the reasons why it ha- we haven't had it is because at the end of the day, the president does have term limits, and no matter how much you, you disagree with them, they will eventually either leave office or they will die. And so if you, one, of the, one of probably the greatest challenges we have today is people are living a long time, right? And so if someone is able to preside in a position of power for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, you tend to have uh, a much greater centralization of power than if they've only got four years or eight years in office. Although we might be looking at the 19th century. The U.S. did have a civil war in the 19th century. Britain hasn't had a civil war since then. So maybe there's something there. If, if um, I could, if I could uh, yeah, jump Patrick, in here. Patrick, it's your turn. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very fascinating discussion. And I'm, I'm glad Safedin brought this up. So just to give some background to some of the people, I believe – He's sort of uh, channeling Hans Hermann Hoppe, who was a who's a, a a follower, sort of a theorist in in the in Rothbard's mold, who argued that a democracy. He was very critical of excuse me. He was very critical of democracy, and he was he was sort of more pro monarchy for some of the reasons Savadine's Savadine's mentioned. In conceived in liberty, it's very interesting. Is Rothbard takes a very sort of pro democracy view because he views the monarchy, the British monarch, monarchy, as basically power. And you had the in many of the colonies, you had royally appointed governors and they were basically the king says, OK, you do this. You're going to have a council, basically like the Senate, so to speak. And they, in theory, have a lot of power. And then it was the lower level assembly that was the one that was democratically elected, at least to, to, the, to the people in the colonies who, who could vote. And I think that is at least uh, worth mentioning. I think the most important thing, at least, all right, so why Great Britain, like that, that British monarchy was successful is, well, really, in, in a sense, almost since the Magna Carta, it was in some way constrained. And then after the Glorious Revolution, it was a constitutional monarchy. Uh, they still managed to have a lot of power other ways through corrupting and buying out parliament. Uh, but they But they did have that. I think you could maybe argue that the most successful monarchies are those in small countries or very constrained, like almost like city states. That's at least the way the argument has been often characterized. Then you could I would think you could make the argument as to having some sort of elected confederation being better than that. I mean, I I would follow in Rothbard's footsteps. I would say the best Government is no government, something like an anarcho-capitalist system. That's a whole different conversation. But I think what Rothbard was getting at with a lot of his empirical research in this was that having some sort of confederation or having some sort of informally linked, very, very low level or locally elected republics uh, actually worked out pretty well. There might not have been explicit checks and balances, but there would have been checks and balances that if one state uh, like the independent countries after the civil, excuse me, after the American Revolutionary War, uh, were taxing too much, people would go to a different state. They could vote with their feet. So those types of uh, regulations were restricted. And having that where when the, the, the local level, so you, you do have people, uh, it is people are close to the representatives, either in like a town hall, say in New England or in a county. And then as Michael pointed out, you have, rotation. This is what the anti-federalists were very, very big on. And I think that's important. You have term limits. 
You can't serve nine consecutive terms. Rothbard was always very critical of having judges appointed for life. He says that's the greatest way to create an oligarchy. And instead, you're having something where, uh, such as in the Confederation, okay, you could only serve so many terms consecutively, uh, or there is a maximum on how much you could you could serve at all. Uh, that worked relatively good. I mean, I, I think I definitely don't think the American Revolution was a mistake. Uh, to go back to the original point, I think the American Revolution had a lot of big benefits. It really weakened feudalism in in what in North America. It really weakened the alliance of throne and altar. It did increase suffrage. I think that was very important. At least just more representation, weakening government's abilities to intervene. Uh, it did lead to revolutions in Europe, trying to encourage the same thing. And then, of course, it did also lead to some noticeable restrictions on slavery. I think America was better off if it just stuck with the Articles of Confederation, never did the Constitution. And we can get into that. I know it's sort of outside of Volume 4. It's in Volume 5. But that was much more of a plan to basically move around the states and then just try to have something elected from like the masses up top, so to speak, or we get into the electoral college and things like that. So I think a local level democracies where there's a lot of them, there's a lot of competition. It's much more of a confederation. I think that's a relatively efficient form of government, at least when people understand sort of the rule of law and things like that. Of course, there's weak weaknesses. I would place my bet in a, over the size of, say, North America, having a confederation like that versus a monarchy. I think monarchies could maybe work in city states. Uh, but once you put them in any sort of large area, even like Japan, Japan was isolated. It was an island. Right. And it wasn't it wasn't as big as, say, China or um, Russia, et cetera. So I think I think those that that that's that just uh, those are some things that we should bear in mind. And I think Rothbard, a lot of his empirical um, illustrations in Conceived and Liberty sort of sort of bear. They, 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 sort, they basically show this theory, I think, or they prove the validity of it. Yeah, no, there's definitely a little bit of a disagreement here between Rothbard and Harper. So Rothbard is very much pro-democracy and views uh, monarchy as the bad guys. But I think there is a reading, there, there is a Hoppian reading of his work. I mean, and Harper was a good friend of Rothbard and a student of Rothbard. And yet, you know, he's, he still likes his work a lot, but they can uh, both disagree on this. Hopefully, just like Michael and I can disagree on it and remain friends. <laughs> Well, let's talk about something we can probably agree on. I, I yes. think that Rothbard does a really good job of showing the perils of fiat economics and yeah. also the perils of, of fiat property. Like we, we talk about fiat currency and the, and the damage it does, but currency is, it's a minor player in this book. I mean, there are a number of examples where colonies like Massachusetts Bay Colony issue their own currency or their own paper currency and they collapse it. And then of course, and they issue debt and the debt collapses and they use it normally to fight wars. And so you have a, a microcosm of fiat currency collapses popping up, including the Revolutionary War where, where the colonial dollar gets issued and, and hyperinflated 200x or something. So there is some discussion of fiat currency collapse, but I thought he did a great job in a very, a very clear, if not blood curdling way of illustrating the peril of fiat economics, you know, and, and what I mean by that is say mercantilism. So mercantil, you know, mercantilism is you imagine a king or some, you know, someone thinking, oh, it, it'd be a great idea. I'm going to sell this noble the concession on tobacco. And he discusses the Virginia company. And first they give the Virginia company a monopoly. And then they decide that the, the tobacco concession is you have to ship the tobacco only in British ships. And so they cut the Dutch out. And so there they undermine transport. And then they decide you have to use British crews. And so they put a labor restriction and a shipping restriction in. And then they decide you have to bring the tobacco to a British port and pay customs on it. And so that's a revenue source. And then they decide, well... You can't grow tobacco in Ireland or the UK because we won't be able to tax it in that port. And so they actually prevent people from growing tobacco anywhere else. So while they're restraining the shipping trade, they're also restraining the competition. The combination of all those things means that you can't sell your tobacco to the Dutch or to the Continentals or the Europeans. So 
So all of the mercantile restrictions drive up the cost of production. Then they drive up the logistics problems. Then they shrink the market. That causes the price to collapse. So then their solution to that is to put in uh, production quotas. So they don't want people to produce as much. And that punishes the farmers that work hard. And it punishes the efficient farmers. And ultimately, they enforce that with a big navy with guns, and then they put in customs, and then they put in a court system, and then they end up with a system of informants. Then they end up turning farmer against farmer, and you have riots and people going from farm to farm in Maryland and Virginia, killing each other, burning each other's crops because they heard that some, someone snitched and said someone else is producing too much tobacco. You know, And when you, when you take all of these things together, you think... How could any rational person have thought it was a good idea to basically turn farmer against farmer, destroy the good ones, you know, uh, blockade everybody that wanted to carry your goods for you cheaper and faster, and then cut yourself out of 90% of the market? But somehow, somehow one person thinks, well, this is how I'm going to make money. I'm not going to tax the British citizens. I'm just going to tax the tobacco and you start out with an idea, tax the tobacco, and it leads to a police state of customs. And after that, pretty soon, you know, that part of the Navigation Act is, oh, you can't actually trade tobacco with other colonists. So you can't sell the tobacco or ship the tobacco to Boston from Virginia. And so you turn the colonies against each other. You turn every honest person or every capitalist into a smuggler. People disrespect the law. They start to ignore the law. And yeah, along the way, the capital destruction is immense. For example, what follows next is the British have to blockade the Chesapeake Bay, and then they end up sinking a bunch of Dutch ships. And so they're in a war with each other. People are dying. And then I think at one point, it might have been the Dutch sank 14 British ships that were just carrying tobacco in them, right? So you're sinking merchantmen, you're, you're killing foreigners, you know, local farmers are pitchforking each other. Everyone is at each other's throats. And that's, you know, kind of the tragedy of mercantilism. And Rothbard illustrates that really, really well, you know, in a way that you feel the pain of everybody involved. And your first thought is, this is just so, you know, like irrational, crazy, stupid. How could anybody have done it? You know, at some point you start to think nobody's so stupid as, as to want to do that, except that somebody at the top of the system had, you know, by fiat said tax tobacco. And then the next layer of people said, okay, therefore let's create a bureaucracy. And the next layer of people said, oh, that means I can build a Navy. And the next layer of people said, oh, that means I can stack the court system. And the next layer of people said, oh, that means I need informants. And the next layer of people said, oh, I can rat out my neighbor and take his stuff. And it just ripples down until there's this systematic cancerous dysfunction. And maybe the person that kicked it off or catalyzed it doesn't really realize, you know, if you're going to be charitable, you say maybe they never realized just how much damage and destruction they did. They didn't. They didn't have the pain receptors, right? I think that the, in, the indictment of fiat is you get these big centralized organizations, whether it's a government or it's a corporation or whatever, the East India Company, the Virginia Company, uh, the king, the, the, the governor. And they, by edict, they demand something. They, you know, this example is I gave you the tobacco monopoly and you can see millions of people putting aside the fact that maybe tobacco isn't good for you, that's another story, but let's assume it was any crop, soybeans or corn or whatever. They just create so much damage. And then you have uh, Rothbard gives you an example of the perils of fiat property, right? And fiat property is like, okay, well, the king just gave a 5 million acre land grant, you know, to Culpepper, or he just gave a land grant to Baltimore and it's the same exact idea, which is when one person grants a fiat, you can have the state of Maryland, or one person grants a, a, a monopoly, you can have tobacco. It's, it's easy for them initially. They get paid off, right? They get some kind of fee. Some noble gave them a kickback, or they said, well, you, could, you don't have to tax the public. This is an easier way to do it. 
but it's a top-down infliction of fiat economics on the population. And the result is police state, war, bureaucracy, inefficiency, a crippled economy, choking. And of course, I think Rothbard's, his view would be bottom up, right? Like the story here is, What if people naturally, organically were able to grow whatever food, ship it, sell it to whoever they wanted? What if you told people, go to the new world and you'll get 100 acres if you show up and farm it for three years, right? That that bottom-up, grassroots, organic uh, economy always results in more prosperity and less violence and bloodshed. And the top-down generally results in the appearance of something simple, but it creates massive violence and dysfunction. And and this book, it's hundreds of examples of the peril of fiat. I'll just say this is one thing that I particularly enjoy about uh, reading Rothbard, Rothbard's history work, uh, is that he gets economics, and that's very different from the vast majority of historians who don't get it. And because they don't get economics, they don't understand how harmful these things are. And so their perspective ranges from either they're loyalists of the regime that imposed those things, and so then they're twisting themselves into knots trying to justify why it was actually a good thing to start a a giant crop burning campaign to teach the tobacco farmers a lesson, or it would be the opposite. They're just kind of populists and thinking of it in the perspective, well, you know, the, the, the government passed laws that were bad, but the government should have passed laws that were good. They should have given the workers the laws. And it's just economic ignorance that doesn't get it and doesn't understand it. Whereas when you read Rothbard, you realize, yep, all of those people just don't understand economics. And they went through a tragic comedy of slapstick errors one after another because they just don't get how things would have been better if they just let anybody produce as much tobacco as they want and sell it for whatever price they want. And if, if you know, even, even the government would have been better off if it just liberalized the market and taxed it at a low rate. And, and you get that from Rothbard, but you don't get it from most other historians. Patrick? Yeah, I, I, I agree with both of you. I thought you made great points. Uh, one uh, regarding Rothbard, uh, he had a quip. Uh, one, he said, the problem with economic historians is half of them are economists who don't know any history, and the other half are historians who don't know any economics, right? And that's, that's very clear with a lot of history in the colonial era, and especially in like the progressive era, et cetera. They say that, well, government passed a law or something was fiat. That means there had to be some sort of wise planning, some some established intellectual or just some bro- with broader vision, they were able to implement uh, this policy. And, and uh, of course, knowing economics, uh, understanding that uh, fiat economics, is, as Michael put it, is, is, is wrongheaded. I mean, really, the whole book begins with, all right, you've got fiat everywhere. Absolutism, the king, whatever he says by decree, that's true. Mercantilism, basically the king passes a bunch of laws to his, the benefit his cronies, benefit certain business interests to establish various laws. And then, of course, feudalism, which is fiat land giveaway, right? The original Virginia company's charter said that they had ownership of the land from sea to sea, which, which literally meant till the Pacific Ocean. Right. And for the longest time, Virginia was even claiming the Midwest because it said, well, we were given this land basically by decree, no understanding of homesteading or actual sort of acquisition of private property and so on. And and one of the things that Rothbard, I think, does really well in the book, as has been pointed out, is, is he goes through these various empirical examples, these these economic examples of just mercantilist policy after mercantilist policy, okay, some sort of restriction of supply, some sort of discriminatory tax, some sort of price control, he even goes through wage controls, right, to benefit the 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 the, the employers of labor, you're going to have artificially low wages, right, to keep the cost of labor down, things that we couldn't almost even uh, imagine uh, in, in today. And in, in, in out of feudalism, you know, feudalism is no longer around, really. Absolutism is no longer around, obviously. Mercantilism is, is still alive, right? It's still alive in the modern governments. The main difference is, well, it's democratic feudal, it's democratic mercantilism, right? It's in, in that, well, you need to grant a special privilege to this business or have certain regulatory barriers to entry because it's in the public interest, right? You need to grant a privilege to a central bank to issue money because <laughs> it's in the public interest. You can't have competition in money. Of course not. You can't do anything like that, or you can't have some sort of decentralized money supply out of the public's control. It's always about centralization. It's always about control. And 
it's it's been like that. It was like that, especially because really before sort of you could say modern free market economics, yeah, you had the Spanish scholastics, you did have some French thinkers. Uh, but, you know, in, in the 1700s, but it was, you know, we think of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, 1776. That was something that really influenced a lot of founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson uh, considered the Wealth of Nations one of his favorite books. I also just think it's it's no coincidence that the book came out in June. The colonists seceded in July of 1776. Of course, you know, they didn't have Amazon Prime or something, so it took a little bit longer. But having those, the, the understanding of ideas, at least, some of these incredibly crazy policies aren't pursued or more accurately, they're just disguised a lot better. Instead of just the king granting a privilege to one of his, of his sort of his cronies because he's close to him and, all right, you get a monopoly, they're going to dress it up as some sort of in the name of health and safety or um, and to, to promote economic welfare and, and so on. And, and uh, you know, th- that's, I think, that the, the, a lot of the colonists were really fighting the mercantilist restrictions. Unfortunately, some of them just didn't like Brit- Great Britain because they wanted to impose their own. But part of that understanding from Cato's letters in John Locke was we don't have to have this. There's alternative forms of, of governance. There's alternative forms of, of, of economics. Yeah, having things t- bottom down, you know, bottom up. That's really how America grew. It didn't grow through any sort of c- central planning or British Navigation Act, something like that. It was through people just deciding on their own, rationally making their own decisions to trade, to truck barter, exchange with other people, and so on. You know, that's what made uh, America great, and I think that's what sort of shines through. And we always need to be on the lookout for that for that fiat economics, because although you know kings and queens and in in tobacco ships and all sorts of stuff are long and gone, but we, we still have the same policies just dressed up in the modern era, um, you know, with technology and uh, all, all, all of the latest. So I think that's a huge takeaway from the book. I, I think there's an interesting, interesting observation here that you see, uh, you see fiat government and you see fiat economics and you see fiat property it's it's the story of the inefficiency of central planning right the, this this book is is really an indictment of central planning and uh, and so whenever y- you have examples of governors you have examples of parliament you have examples of corporations and you have examples of monarchs all implementing fiat edicts fiat property edicts fiat protocols this is this is the religion you will adopt. This is your speech protocol. This is how you will uh, live. I mean, the, there are lots of examples of governors stacking courts, stacking assemblies, changing laws. In many cases, they served as their own judge and jury and executioner. They negotiated their own treaties. They started their own wars. I mean, governors would start a war, stop a war um, with the Indians, especially with other colonists. So. There's a lot of fiat here, and uh, it, it generally creates carnage and chaos and, and cripples the economy. But I thought that, Saifedean, you would get a kick out of this. That you know, uh, I read uh, Charles II grants 5 million acres to Hopkins in 1649. It's a land grant. And you know what I thought? I thought pre-mine. <laughs> and so, so if you were to think about what works well, it's organic from the bottom up, which is what Bitcoin is. And if you think about what keeps breaking down, it's the leader and in, in, uh, changes the protocol. People just randomly change laws. It's, it's kind of like the leader of some altcoin, you know, making up some new rules, you know, for the next hard fork after hard fork after hard fork. So you see lots of that. And then you see people launching their own coins with pre-mines And generally, you know, the people, you can say, well, the people did that or the people did that. The people all kind of act like people are going to act over the course of thousands of years. So looking at the reaction of the people to the fiat edicts tells you a lot. And generally what, what you hear is somebody came in and imposed a government, the people rebelled. They imposed taxes, the people rebelled. They impro- imposed a new religion, the people rebelled. They imposed a bunch of, you know, industrial monopolies, the people rebelled. And when they could run, when they could leave, 
right? They just left with their feet or voted with their feet. And so the nonviolent protest was they fled the colony that, that was most abusive to them. And, and that's a natural protocol for virtue, right? That this, is, this would be an example why a monarch of a small city state might be a better monarch than a monarch of a big nation. Because if you're running a, a Singapore, you know, uh, or something like that, and you do something really stupid, everybody flees your city, right? And, and no one stops in your port, and then you all starve to death. So, so you have a natural virtue, as long as there's mobility. And then when people lost the ability to run, if they could vote, if they could form an assembly and vote and protest, the assemblies protested. And there's lots of examples of very courageous objections to authoritarian governors. People, I mean, they were pretty tough then. I mean, they would stand up for what they believed even when they got lashed, jailed. The number of times people were indicted jailed for their beliefs, uh, you know, had their property seized. It's just over and over again, not hundreds, but thousands and thousands of times people stood up for their belief and, and they would if they could until it got to the point where they realized it wasn't going to work. And then they were, if they were stuck and they couldn't leave or they felt like they'd have to abandon their property, they resorted to violence. And then you did just get lots of violence, you know, from, from the very beginning, you know, it, it wasn't like we waited until the revolutionary war to be violently objecting. There was just continual objection. So I, I think that one of the great things Rothbard does, he kind of articulates the benefits of organic protocol driven, like this is a fair protocol. Everyone that shows up will be able to get 40 acres or everyone that shows up can peacefully buy land. And when there is some organic protocol like that, then you had peaceful growth that was efficient. And then every time someone implemented a, f a fiat protocol, right, you, you end up with corruption, graft, violence, noncompliance, civil disobedience, you know, uh, to, to the point where lots and lots of people died if you had the virtue of being able to look at it, then maybe it would have made you a more humble, more thoughtful leader, right? All, all you can say in the defense of the people of the time is information moves slow and the pain and the agony that someone in parliament, some lobbyist in parliament implemented on someone in South Carolina didn't get to them for a year or two or three years. And oftentimes they would do something that would cause a rebellion and uh, 10,000 people are dead before the person that instigated, you know, the fiat even figures out what they did. And, and as I pointed out with Charles II, when he realized there was a problem, he tried to de-escalate, but information was moving so, so poorly and inefficiently that uh, even if you wanted to be rational, the system is unstable because of the lack of feedback, I think. The, the reason that you don't put your hand on a hot stove and burn it off is because your reflexes, right? No one's stupid enough to burn their own hand off because they can feel the pain. And in these systems, what you had was a very slow motion of, of pain-based information. And so, it, you know, even self-interested rational people might do things that are long-term not in their best interest because the information systems and the governance systems, they were so unstable that they didn't get that pain feedback fast enough. And, you know, and maybe like if you, if you have an edict that impacts a hundred thousand people, it's hard for you to, f to hear the psychic screams or the actual screams of a hundred thousand people. You're just getting everything spoon fed through uh, a, a, bureau a bureaucrat who is going to suppress the signal and then just extract the news that they want you to hear in order to support their interest and, that's one of the challenges of government throughout this entire time period that I think Rothbard, he has 2020 hindsight. He gets to write the book 300 years later with all the information at the same time, but no one living in that period had all that information in front of them. Yeah. I think that's a very powerful analogy between the pre-mine and proof of work versus land grants and homesteading. In, in today's world, a lot of people don't understand the distinction between legitimate property versus illegitimate property. And so they think uh, property is just whatever the government says. So the reason this person owns a piece of land is because the government decides that they own it because they keep track record of it. And they don't understand the concept of 
natural rights and natural law as applicable to property, which is, I believe, completely essential as a founding principle of what economics is, and I discuss it in Principles of Economics, legitimate property is property that you acquire because nobody else was using it. You know, it's empty land. You put a fence around it and you put your name on it and you say, this is my land. If nobody else has a claim to that land, then it's yours. You work in it, you build a house, you put up a fence, it becomes yours and then it becomes legitimate property. And that's similar to proof of work. You know, you go and you, you go out there, you solve the uh, proof of work problems and then you get freshly minted Bitcoins that are yours legitimately. And the other way of legitimately acquiring land or Bitcoin is to find somebody who has legitimate Bitcoin and exchange them uh, for them. You work the property that's empty or you buy the property in, in a fair transaction. When that happens organically and you build a community, you know, that, that community that bought the property fairly or worked the property tends to be stable and healthy and uh, nonviolent and constructive. And then when someone 10,000 miles away gives away all your property <laughs> to a, a, a lobbyist for a nickel, and then that guy shows up and says, now you have to leave your land and abandon it. It's mine, right? That, then you end up with rebellion. That happened many times. Right, where a, gov a governor would grant someone's land, or someone in the UK would grant land, you know, and and every time there's a change in administration, someone has their property ripped away. Yeah. So that created violence, and then the other thing would happen is they grant them the rights to tax you. So somebody shows up and says, "The king gave me the right, or the governor gave me the right to tax all of upstate New York. You all owe me these quick rents," and people said you know, screw you. Why should I have to give you money just because someone I've never met? And in the extreme, it became the battle between Vermont and New York, right? Where, where the governor of New York wanted to give away the land of the people in Vermont and the people, you know, to people in New Hampshire. And uh, so there, there became this little political football of I'll start my own state. And that way I can, I can escape the sovereignty of that state. I can I can obviously uh, relate to that from a personal perspective as a Palestinian. It was also some British guy granting land that was not theirs. You know, the British Prime Minister wrote Lord Balfour wrote a letter to a British banker, uh, Lord Rothschild, and told him, uh, you know what, uh, that piece of land called Palestine, we should make it into a national homeland for Jews, and you know tough titties for the people who are uh, not Jews on that land. And look how well that worked out. It's been a century of bloodshed since that came out because it superseded uh, property rights. And, you know, millions of Palestinians are refugees today because they got kicked out of their homes because people said, hey, you know, the British Empire said this and the British military tried to enforce it. And then the Zionist uh, gangs, which later become the Israeli military, continue to enforce it until this day, wherein this is, um, you, you supersede legitimate property rights of people who have owned land for hundreds of years, and you replace them by edict, and that doesn't work out. So we do find that in the US, in, the, in, in conceived in liberty, but I think it is what distinguishes the US perhaps, and modern US history is perhaps the fact that this is not the norm as opposed to the homesteading, which is, what constituted probably the majority of the land. Ultimately, it was it, it, it was settlers and migrants who came to empty plots of land and took them on that built the country, I would argue. Beyond, and, and I think things would have been more peaceful, more prosperous if the British had just enforced property rights there rather than just make more land grants. I think, yeah, we agree on that. I mean, the things that are tragic and regrettable in human in American history are the fiat land grants that disenfranchise the Native Americans or that disenfranchise one colonist for another colonist or disenfranchised, you know, this person for that. And that generally resulted in tragedy, injustice, and violence and the like. But the but the stuff that's the thing that's virtuous about America is the property that was developed via hard work, via homesteading, via fair trade via purchase, you know, free flow of capital and through human industry in a peaceful way. And there's a lot of that. I mean, after, you know, after the first thing, we ended up with a lot of the second thing. And of course, you could say the health of a society, the economic health of a society, and perhaps the moral health of a society 
is a function of what percentage of economic activity is due to free trade, work and free trade, versus what percentage of economic activity is is mandated by fiat and you know a monopoly given to my friend or or my lobbyist or an edict issued from above and the economies that have more freedom they grow in a peaceful way and and people feel f- people trust the system and in an economy controlled by fiat edict they grow normally in a well they they're very inefficient they may shrink they they tend to actually foment violence at some point and if they don't foment violence from within they leave that society vulnerable to violence from without because ultimately they cripple they cripple the ideology and they cripple the culture right and you know the the fascinating thing uh, and cripple the technology one of the fascinating things i think is and this is a side point but with regard to the indians you, you end up asking the question how come they didn't actually adopt the superior ideologies of the Europeans and how come they were never able to copy the superior technologies of the Europeans because if you look through the history of Asia and Europe for 10,000 years you see examples of the Hittites the Turks the Syrians they would get trampled by one barbarian tribe but then in the next chapter of history they figured out how to smelt iron uh, you know they they figured out bronze they figured out iron they eventually figure out steel and they come and they fight back so so and, and or one tribe gets crushed because another tribe has a superior religion and and a superior ideology and then they uh the tribe that gets crushed adopts either adopts that religion because they realize that's superior or they create a countervailing one that's just as good and what's interesting about the indians is you you know you find they're trampled by a more organized european tribe with guns and and better technology but they never really did figure out how to adjust and you know they couldn't manufacture their own guns and one of the subtext of this is might makes right whoever's got the guns and the power generally wins the struggle even if they're in the wrong and there's a lot of uh time and attention spent by the Europeans keeping the Indians from getting guns right so like they they do not you know at one point it was the death penalty to sell a gun or to a to an, a native american indian or to sell them ammunition or to teach them how to shoot and so so there's a lot of just raw military power that ripples through and i guess what you you'd conclude is if your culture manages or or the the people manage to adopt that technical technical power or that political power or that system then maybe they will fight back and they will reach some new equilibrium or, or or go on but if they don't somehow absorb the ideology and the technology then they just get squeezed progressively off all the property and and out of the history and that's what we saw here from the point of view of the native americans yeah, it's quite unfortunate what happened uh, to the to the Native Americans, and we can go into all sorts of reasons. I mean, I, I think some historians argue that they had a sort of a similar like Black Death uh, type event that happened to them several hundreds of years before you had some of the early settlers, and that wiped out enough of their population where they didn't have, you could say, enough people to sort of nip the colonists in the bud. Rothbard doesn't really get into that. When, when we think of the just the... the the, the, the acquisition of private property, because that was a huge defining feature, you could say, of the colonists, um, as opposed to the uh, as opposed to the Native Americans or, or, or other groups. I mean, the really the the colonists they 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 knew how to homestead. They were you know they had that sort of that that concept of working with the land, and yeah, they did kind of have a basic understanding, I think, of private property, even without reading anything, because they said, hey, I traveled all the way over here, either voluntarily or un- involuntarily, if uh, they were an indentured servant. And they said, I had to till all of this land. I'm not going to work on the land that someone just gave a massive land grant for. I'm going to work on my own land that's just a little bit farther out west. And I'm going to grow my own stuff. And if you try to raise taxes or try to restrict it in any way, they did have a lot of laws. Fortunately, though, many of those laws weren't always enforced uh, because the colonists just rebelled. They got their pitchforks, they got their muskets, and they were going to defend what they 
intuitively and correctly understood as what was theirs and it was not someone else's for the taking. And I think one of the important ideas that was taught in Cato's letters and a lot of these sort of pamphlets that were read by the colonists in the 1700s was they viewed the king as this aggressor. The king was sort of this cancer, the power. It was this cancer that that just took stuff. And this was this conquest theory of the state as opposed to the social contract theory um, that, well, governments are voluntarily formed. Instead, the reality is that governments are formed through conquest, right? Uh, the modern, Eng modern England was formed, as it was mentioned earlier, by this guy named William the Conqueror. It was literally in his name, right? And, and so, yeah, having that, that, that just understanding, I think, of, of private property really helped the colonists. And then the other, the, the other concept I think that's important to at least sort of go through when we talk about mercantilism or why were these policies passed, even though they had all these terrible consequences, is, is that they were all crony. <laughs> They were, it was all cronyism. It was all special interest policies. You, the king granted a favor to this one company. He didn't really like the, the, the long term effects or how it affected everyone else. That wasn't what the king or the, the business was thinking about. It was about how do I benefit England or Great Britain at the expense of everyone else, right? Great Britain and really initially England designed their whole colonial structure was they wanted a raw export market. They wanted just tobacco, rice, fish, uh, lumber, uh, maize, all of that. They didn't want anything manufactured in the colonies, right? They, they also didn't want any money created in the colonies. They wanted all of that stuff to be sent to, to England, and then England would manufacture everything, and then they'd ship everything back, and they'd charge, uh, they, they'd charge an arm and a leg for it, right? And that was, it was ultimately cronyism. It was, it was just special interest policies to benefit one group at the expense of another, and very hard to stop those types of policies when the public doesn't understand them. The most important thing that economists can do, or really anyone interested in these ideas, is, is, is education. The colonial era was at least a, a period where there was some education just from sort of intuitive understanding, and people revolted uh, because otherwise the people pushing for cronyism or pushing for fiat policies, they're always going to have the intellectual apologists on their side. They're always going to have the relevant priests or economists or court you know, speaker or whatever to say, oh, yes, these policies are really benefiting us. The problem, the reason why we have no more tobacco is, well, that's just some crop failure. That's due to evil speculators or it hasn't did anything to do with these policies. And, and your average person, if they don't know any better, they're going to go and believe it. And that's unfortunately, you could say what's happened a lot in the modern day United States. It happened certainly in, in colonial America, but it was a grueling process. You could say grueling deaths, violence, um, genocide, war uh, of just learning that, hey, what's mine is mine and you can't take it and I'm going to fight you for it. And that, hey, actually, maybe the best policy is the policy of salutary neglect is what Fortunately, some people in Great Britain understood it's that the best way to let the colonies benefit us is not by taxing them and restricting them and suffocating them. It's actually just letting them grow, right? Just just letting your your child grow. And I think that's a very so important point. What would be the what would be the term you would apply to a culture that believes in private property rights? I, I, I would I would go ahead and I would say it would be a, a libertarian culture or a, a natural rights culture. I think, of course, that term can be misused, but I would think they believe in private property. A, a, liber a liberal culture, maybe? A liberal culture, as it was originally understood, like we would call classical liberal. But yeah, a liberal culture, which really was libertarian. Here's a point that I would make, which is it seems like the British planted a very – a very, um, I'd say, healthy liberal culture into the new world. And the benefits of those colonists were they were educated. They had that liberal, uh, that liberal ideology. They had private property rights. They had superior technology. But superior technology is not enough if they didn't have superior ideology. They had a very weak indigenous population to displace, either either because of uh, you know lack of immunity or because of their own Stone Age ideology. And the point that the tribes hold all the land meant that the that the tribal culture of the American Indians didn't allow for any private property ownership. So the American Indians were not a liberal culture. They were they were in a way 
much more primitive, not just primitive technically, but primitive ideologically, not, not having the idea of, of an individual being able to own property and give it to their children or something. And then the, the fascinating question is, or the fascinating issue is, the British colonized everywhere in the world, right? And, and we have examples of this same British culture in Africa and the same British culture in India and the way the British treated uh, the Chinese and Hong Kong and, and the like. And, and the story doesn't turn out the same in these other places. For example, the British showing up in India don't come up against a very weak Stone Age culture without property rights. They come up against the entire Indian nation of 100 million plus people. And, and so I don't think they had the power and, and there, there wasn't that, uh, what is it, the crucible or the, to incubate this thing. One thing I noticed when, when I read it is um, if you look at the population in South Carolina or North Carolina when they first, in the, in the 1670s, they only had a few thousand people. Right. There are only, there are 20,000 people in Virginia for, for half of this time period. There were five, 10,000 people. There were small numbers of people. And so a, they really needed to have a weak indigenous population or there's no way they're going to take hold and control these colonies. They're, they're going to get displaced. They couldn't have done this in China or India. And the second B is at the point that the British colonists got to a few million people, when they got to the point where they had prospered and had children and children's children, the mass of manpower in North America was such that there was no way the British could impose their authority from across the Atlantic because the ratio, you know, I can send 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 soldiers at a time but I can't send a million soldiers at a time across the Atlantic. So once, once they got to a certain size, they were going to break off naturally because of the distance and because they had all the power locally, right? I mean, you have m- most manpower in New England. What's interesting leading up to the Revolutionary War is the colonists, you know, the Ben Franklins of the world and the John Adams of the world, they're in the Thomas Jeffersons and the Thomas Paines. They're pretty good communicators and they're doing a good job of conditioning the entire nation to fight and, and to rally and to unify against the British. A hundred years earlier, under, say, Governor Berkeley, he was against education, against free speech, against books. The early colonists, they didn't, they didn't really have a developed, uh, a developed communications network and they didn't have the intellectuals. But certainly we know by the time of the Revolutionary War, there were a lot of very well considered intellectuals in the American colonies that were articulating the case for freedom and sovereignty. And so they were able to intellectually outwit or, or intellectually counter the British, as well as counter them with with comparable technology and then counter them with manpower. And that's why that nation was born. If we look at what happened in African colonies and Indian colonies, it's a very, very different outcome. And you don't end up getting this new American colony based on British liberal ideals. You end up with something which is which is captured by its own history and it's and its own its own manpower dynamics because you just can't displace them all from mm-hmm. a power point of view. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a, it's a great point. I mean, when we think one, we spoke about this last podcast, but obviously having the abundance of land, you don't have that huge indigenous population, and so many of the colonists were obviously from England or from uh, from Great Britain, and so they they had a lot of those ideas. England. England always had a better system of governance than uh, at least uh, in the more uh, recent years uh, around the time of conceding liberty than, say, France or Spain. They always their government was more limited, at least uh, the monarchy had more restrictions. They did understand those concepts of, 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 uh, you know, of, of private property. A big thing that really helped the colonies in the 1600s was <laughs> England was just so preoccupied. They were preoccupied. They're fighting civil wars. They're fighting wars with the Dutch. They're fighting wars with the French, fighting wars with the Spanish. There's this huge distance of land. 
they're, they're, the, the columnists just kind of do what they wanted. Uh, the government changed multiple times. The king got beheaded. And then, then there was sort of all, you know, Cromwell was doing his own thing. And then the king came back and then they brought in a new king. All of these, all of these changes in that yeah, ever since the, the glorious revolution in, in the English Bill of Rights, really setting up sort of a constitutional monarchy, kind of helped England in the long run. It's a big reason why they had their industrial revolution later on and also why uh, the United States kind of had theirs. They were all of their systems of government from the new state constitutions created in the Revolutionary War were, were consciously, you know, they, they were influenced by the British. They were trying to take the best stuff from them. And that's that's very important. And I think that's a huge reason. One, they were the only ones there. Uh, the Native Americans, they, they got they got pushed out. Their population wasn't big enough. And so many of the people were obviously from the country that had a lot of these ideas. Of course, Great Britain with all of its faults. And that's why they were able to kind of get the ground running. And it was that liberal ideology or what I would maybe call just libertarian, just because I think the liberal word is corrupted, but it's still Rothbard uses the word liberal, even in contrast to like conservative meant something totally different, much more of the reactionary mercantilist ideology of, of the day. And, and, and that's a, that's an incredibly important reason. The, the ideology was, re, you know, was responsible for one allowing, uh, enabling so many people to be born. The historians have looked at the the actual anthropological record, or you could say, or just the record of heights. Americans weighed more. They were taller than their counterparts in Europe. There was just so much stuff. They could eat so much. They had so much space. There was so much fresh air. A lot of them weren't living in cities like they were in Europe and Paris was overcrowded and all sorts of a stuff. A lot more beef. A lot more beef. Yes, that's very important. Uh, of course, apparently a lot of people would say the diet wasn't great. It was a lot of potatoes, um, a lot of a lot of starch. But anyway, I mean, so it's just a it's just something to 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 note that there was a lot of good things going for the colonists, and that's once their population is, as Michael pointed out, once their population was big enough, it was only a matter of time. Great Britain could have kept them in if they had sort of enabled them to have a seat at the government and parliament in London. Uh, I don't think that would have worked for so long, but it could have sort of prolonged the process. But once they were so big and once enough of the Americans were radicalized by secession, which is a huge topic, a huge part of conceiving liberty we haven't really spoken about, and, and they had decided, you know what, the king's not going to help us. The king's going to just uh, really screw us. We're going to have to secede. And and that's once you had that that critical mass, even the British military, a lot of them, the generals were reluctant. They There was a couple strategies they could have had, split the colonies around Saratoga and New York. And or then after that failed, that was pretty much like the war was all. Oh, it was just a matter of time. And then they tried to go up through the south and all this. But there was just too many people. And, and, and Great Britain had, had literally created this this problem, you could say. They, they, they broke away, which was the natural organic process to, to secede from the original government. So if you, wanted to, if you wanted to characterize this in a simple biological metaphor, you'd say you, you dropped the apex political predator into the new world in a very high energy and energy rich environment with very weak natural competitors in the in the same niche and it just displaced it displaced all of uh, the other political creatures multiplied expanded uh, you know the entire environment and kept spreading until it took over the entire continent you know all we, we pretty much took all of the land that we wanted from east coast to west coast and maybe we stopped at the desert in the south and the tundra at the north but it really is a very darwinian process based upon, you know, natural behavior. Oh, absolutely. And, and we get into even later of the United, the United States expanding, unfortunately, was its own process of conquest. Most of the land we took from the Spanish Empire, uh, the Spanish and French empires, their colonies, they had basically hurt themselves because they didn't send enough of their people there. And that's because those countries ultimately didn't have enough of a good system to actually sustain those types of populations or to develop the institutions that would sustain those populations. So once we kick You could say they were illiberal, yeah. right? That they didn't have they didn't have that liberal culture. Yeah, absolutely. They didn't have a culture of private property rights and 
and they weren't they weren't agriculturalist either right they didn't they didn't come to farm the land the spanish came to abuse or basically basically rape the land and uh, and the french were were somewhat traders but probably monopolist traders and and they were not settlers oh yeah they they, right? they had their absolutist monarchy and part of that was because France and Spain didn't go through those revolutions. They didn't go through a revolution and all those difficulties that England went through in the 1600s. Francis came later, <laughs> and it was it was much more tragic, you could say, not only for France but also for all of Europe. But you know, England had that issue in England. You could say geography based that English Channel, probably the most significant geographical feature of Europe, uh, having it's just a separate island and. And so it, it basically it, it, Britain won out over France, over Spain. After the end of the French and Indian War, Great Britain was the undisputed superpower of North America and of the war. I mean, of the war, the world, excuse me. And, and then when we broke away, the United States, we became the undisputed superpower of North America and then later of the world. And really the decaying Spanish empire, as, 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 as you mentioned, Michael, they didn't develop any of the necessary infrastructure. They just wanted to get gold and kill people. They put people on basically like slave plantation farms. One of the interesting things I think that often gets neglected is that most, the vast majority of the, of the slaves from Africa, from the slave trade, uh, they went to Spanish colonies. Uh, they, they went to South America, um, uh, Spanish or Portuguese colonies. They went to Cuba. They went to Brazil, South America, where a lot of them died. Most, really, the total amount of slaves imported from Africa, I think, into the North American colonies was around 400,000. Compare that to about the 9 million or something that went to the Caribbean and uh, South America. I mean, it's just it's just night and day, and most of them obviously tragically died. There's a, I, yeah. I think you make a great point there, right? Uh, but th there's something that also stuck out to me in reading this book, which is um, there was this germ of a of of virtue and liberal tradition that was very special in in Britain, even as we criticize it and. And uh, it pops up in this example in Maryland, right? When uh, Maryland was created as a colony, right, they, uh, the king granted Lord Baltimore a proprietary interest in all of Maryland. And that's the fiat property edict. And, and there you would say that that looks no different than any other monarchy might have acted. But here's where it's different. One of the provisos is that he could only tax the people in the colony with the consent of an assembly of freemen that is convened from that colony. When that assembly convened, they refused to approve taxes for more than one year at a time. <laughs> so, so we remember that, oh, there's a proprietary colony. But if you think about how enlightened that was, right, that came, you know, out of Britain in the 1600s, they sent a guy to, to uh, colonize Maryland. They said, yeah, well, you're going to have to, you're going to have to arrange elections of the free people in the state and you can't tax them without their approval. You know, you remember the taxation without representation. That was part of the culture, right? There, there, there aren't really a lot of examples in history of Spaniards and the French or the Indians that had that in their culture, that they had the right of approval over taxes from their governors. And yet somehow, 150 years before the American Revolution, in the British psyche is this idea that, yeah, you may be the governor, but you still need to get the approval of the people that you govern when you tax them. And I, I thought that was, uh, uh, that was very enlightened, right, and, and very liberal. And so you, get, you got to look at that and say, that that was in the culture, e even in the excesses of the colonies when the governors were out of control. What's different is the people knew that that was inappropriate, right? There, there was a sense, there was at least a ideological dissent that, that that's not appropriate to tax people without their approval. It's not appropriate to stack the assembly. It's not appropriate to, you know, to seize their property. And there are a lot of other societies where the view was, whatever the leader wants is appropriate. And if the head of the tribe says you don't own property and you go there, then that's what you do. And, and 
there really aren't individual rights. So, so I think you got to trace for hundreds of years before the British ever arrived at the shore and look at the roots of that liberalism and that idea of individual rights for somebody, right? That, that made a difference and maybe that made them superior to the other colonizers. On this topic, I think uh, the, an interesting book I read a long time ago is called A Farewell to Alms, not Arms, Alms, by an economist called uh, Gregory Clark. And he makes the contention that what distinguishes Britain and what drove the Industrial Revolution was the fact that uh, starting in the 1200s, British people started to reduce their fertility and that they, that they went from a model wherein pretty much the rest of the, well, they were like the rest of humanity for the vast majority of humanity's history, wherein you, you know, you hit puberty, you get married and you keep having as many kids as you can. And then you die young and a lot of your kids die and you don't have the, the resources or the time to invest in your kids. And that's basically how humanity has almost always lived. And it's always sort of been assumed that it is, it's industrialization and development and urbanization and education and female education that's going to bring fertility down. But Gregory Clark makes the case that it's the other way around, that uh, British people just started to develop uh, the desire to have fewer kids so that they could invest more in those kids. And that led to centuries of high levels of investment in children. And then children would grow up to have been well-educated and then they wouldn't have many kids themselves. So you were reducing the size of the family individually, but then you ended up with a higher level of investment. And he argues this helped foster the values that brought about the Industrial Revolution. I think it's, it's, it's a pretty compelling point. And I think in general, more broadly, I think those values and institutional ideas that you mention as being favorable for British success in the US, I think in general, you see these as also being a product of development and an increase in uh, income and an increase in uh, capitalism and trade. If you want to be part of the division of labor, and I make this point repeatedly in Principles of Economics, my new book, if you want to benefit from the division of labor, if you want to benefit from the ability uh, to increase your productivity enormously by trading with others, you need to become civilized in the sense of being able to talk to a stranger and being able to reach mutual agreement with them on a deal and not look to uh, cut corners and cheat them at every point in time to be able to respect other people and respect their property. If you're able to ac accept that point, accepting people's property rights, trading with them, respecting their will, not trying to impose your will through violence on them, then we can have nice things. We can build civilization. We can have division of labor and we can develop as a society and as a civilization. And I think there's a case to be made that Britain was ahead of the rest of the world and uh, rest of Europe because of that, probably because of the fertility thing. But I think uh, perhaps what drove that is the fact that they were the part of Europe that was the most peaceful by virtue of the fact that it was a relatively homogenous population isolated by land from the rest of Europe. It made it very difficult for people in other countries to get on a boat, send an army, go to Britain and fight um, and, and occupy, which is much easier done when you're in Germany or in France or in Spain or all these land connected areas where it's easy to surround them and easy to invade them. I think, I think there's a, be an interesting book to be written or analysis to be done if you were to compare the parallels, the development of Britain and its liberal culture and its economic success and the like to the development of the United States. Because you, to your point, What's fascinating is, is there's this Western culture that's developed, you know, the, the tradition of the Greeks and the Romans and, 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 the, and the like through hundreds and, well, many, many centuries of struggle that eventually leaps into Britain. And then in, in the history of Britain, you see, you know, a lot of vicious wars between the various tribes and a, a lot of uh, inhumanity and atrocity, you know, the way that they treated the Scots and the Welts and the, and the Irish. And so there's, there's an unpleasantness, but they're incubating uh, sort of a homogeneous liberal culture behind the English Channel. And after William the Conqueror, no one's invading the UK. So they end up getting a thousand years to incubate. And 
for the most part, they've got a defensive system that protects them from being overrun by barbarians, by Mongols, by by Goths, by Visigoths, fill in the blank of how many different armies rampaged across Europe over the course of the thousand years. And one of the things you need if you want to develop a higher level civilization is you need time to think and you need time to, to experiment and you can't have a hostile enemy coming and murdering everybody every hundred years or, or you just get knocked back and, and you don't ever recover. And so the British kind of had that benefit of being an isolated nation with a liberal tradition that incubated from point A and progressed to point B. And I think that we could probably agree that they did progress in civility over time, right? I mean, at one point, one of the, one of the governors that's hanging uh, the rebels, he laments that he can't draw and quarter them. Right. OK, so so British common law at some point outlawed drawing and quartering, even though they had it in the past. And, and you got to rights of the individual and rights of the accused and at least a presumption of of civil rights that developed. And then that idea, right, that British liberal tradition, which probably incubated from 1066 to 1600, it leaps across the pond to a new uh, a new crucible where uh, now you've got a, a, a 3,000 nautical mile moat instead of, uh, instead of the English Channel. And, uh, and it, it begins anew. And all of those ideas in the British tradition get, they get, I don't know, I guess iterated a few more times, many times actually. Probably there's a, there's a rapid iteration if you consider how many colonial experiments between South Carolina and North Carolina and Georgia and Massachusetts Bay and Boston and New Hampshire and, Ver and Vermont and New York and Pennsylvania and New Jersey, they're working out a lot of different ideas, fighting with each other, you know, class warfare ideas, you know, governance ideas, assembly and the like, you know, the plebs versus the aristocrats. And then somehow there's an amalgam of all of that, and it all comes together to push back against the British. So the British are the convenient foil, and the only way you bring together 12 tribes is you have to have a common enemy, right? The Greeks needed the, the Persians, and you know the Romans needed the Carthaginians, and, and so on and so forth. So the Americans have the British to push back against, and then that brings together these very disparate groups into this this nation called America. And there's some good things that come out of it and some not good things, but the good things really are, you know, a, a, a republic of checks and balances with a bill of rights. There are plenty of examples where people didn't have freedom of assembly. They couldn't say what they wanted. They got jailed and they lost their property if they disagreed with the governor. And you can see that, you know, Jefferson and you know, and uh, and the other founding fathers thought that maybe that wasn't a good idea. And there is a sense, uh, a much stronger sense of the rights of the individual following the revolution and the Bill of Rights and and uh, and our Constitution. So, you know, you may not love everything that came afterwards, but you can definitely see if I had to pick a template for a government that might allow for a liberal economy and a liberal democracy to prosper. I think the American template is the the best one I can point to right now. I certainly can't think of something that came before that I thought was better. The syllabus for my new online economics course, Principles of Economics, is now available on safedean.com. The course will take place over 18 lectures, each based on one chapter from my new book, Principles of Economics, which will be available for free as an ebook for everyone registering for the course. Lectures will be released once every two weeks on Mondays, starting on the 25th of September 2023, and will be available in video and audio format. Live discussion seminars will be held once a week on Thursdays at alternating time slots, 12 hours apart, to ensure learners can attend from all over the world. To enroll, Sign up for a membership on safedean.com and receive a 20% discount if you sign up before the 20th of September. I, to, to add on to that, I know because we were talking, um, Safedean was mentioning some books. I think there's a couple of very relevant books here. One of them is by Thomas Sowell. It's called Conquest and Cultures. And he spends a lot of time talking about just the evolution of the British Isles. And it's just how literally it was this melting pot of just 
first the Romans invaded, then you had the Saxons invade, then you had the Vikings invade, then you obviously had the Norman invade, right, uh, with with William the Conqueror and and just sort of that whole development and how that sort of created this very unique environment. Um, a related book that kind of sort of picks up around that time period is I, Bruce Benson's The Enterprise of Law, because we've been mentioning common law around this time uh, in, in the, the evolution. One of the things that made Britain so great was that this idea of common law did not originate from the government. It really started after the collapse of the Roman Empire and had all of these decentralized, basically tribes uh, or groups, uh, the hundred, uh, as I believe they were called, in the British Isles, and they would sort of adjudicate through arbitration, and uh, the, really the, the government only got involved in law once they realized they could get their cut. William the Conqueror started to codify a lot of the rules and make it so of you committed a crime, you stole someone's sheep, you don't have to pay them restitution, which was how the sort of the arbitration system worked. But you got to pay me or I'm going to jail you. Uh, That obviously happened with, uh, I think, um, Edward Edward Long Long Shakes. Similar thing happened in Ireland, a similar system of basically sort of voluntary law that was gradually taken over. Even though the government took it over in um, in England, you still had a lot of those features. This law that was created through judicial rulings, it wasn't through legislatures. It was through just looking at individual cases, case by case. Uh, a lot of um, important takeaways that really provided the foundation for common law. And it is sort of, you could say, almost in, influenced the Magna Carta or just the idea of the nobles rebelling against the king and then parliament rebelling against Charles I and all of this late, much later on. And this, this, this very, very important tradition that was not only necessary for, you could say, liberty or private property, but of course, for economic growth. Uh, the other, the, the last book is The Transatlantic Persuasion by Robert Kelly. This book came out in the 60s and 70s. And he shows that there is this huge link. This is a little bit after uh, Conceived in Liberty, but this this direct link on, on Michael's point between the British culture and between the United States and how that liberal culture, basically a peace, private property, personal liberty was was carried through. You have Adam Smith. You have Thomas Jefferson. Uh, then it goes into like the Democrat Party of, of Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, and finally through Grover Cleveland, that they were many ways closely linked with a lot of British reformers. Really, the the most successful, you could say, free trade achievement in the 1800s, the Walker Tariff of 1846, that was that was achieved uh, through a cooperation of of uh, Peel, the, the repeal of the Corn Laws in Great Britain. I know that's farther off from uh, our discussion here, but uh, it was really this this link, this this transatlantic link. Uh, is why we could say that for the longest period of time, Great Britain and the United States, for all of their faults, uh, had the best forms of governance, had the best economies. Great Britain has, has, has fallen by the wayside after two world wars. Uh, that would do it to you. But uh, there's there's absolutely a common pattern here. And it's really just a, a combination of geography, a combination of voluntary, spontaneous, organic built law, and just going through your growing pains of revolutions before other countries do. So Great Britain went through its turmoil in the 1600s, and that put it in a position of basically unmatched superiority compared to France and Spain and, and, and so on. And, and it, it, it's just, just some important facts that we kind of sort of adding on to the discussion that I think uh, should be emphasized. Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to mention this earlier when we were discussing monarchy, but I think a very relevant and interesting read here is a book by the current ruling prince of uh, Liechtenstein, Prince Hans Adam, who is a bit of an Austrian economist himself. He's uh, influenced by the Austrians. And he's written a book called The State in the Third Millennium, which I think is a truly, truly uh, innovative work of political philosophy. And we don't have many of these these days. And and in this book, uh, Prince Hans Adam makes the case that this role of the state in the 21st century and the way that the state can better provide freedom is that rather than being a place where people fight and argue about what should be done, the state needs to move to a more of a CEO executive model, wherein the prince or the executive has more authority 
and has a fewer checks and balances effectively and fewer people that get to tell him what to do. He's got more authority, but people have the ability to secede. They have the right to self-determination. So this is really turning around political progress as we understand it over the last few centuries on its head. Because the way that we think of political progress, and that is largely down to the U.S. American Revolution and to the French Revolution, is that your political progress happens when you decentralize power away from an executive. You make it more of a decentralized power sharing agreement where you've got parliaments and you've got governments and you've got all kinds of different authorities with responsibilities and checks and balances on each other. And... This, you know, is, is a way to prevent tyranny from developing. Prince Hans Adam's argument is that the way you actually get more effective government is rather than having everybody argue and fight about what needs to happen, people just get the right to secede at very small local levels. So small towns and hamlets in Liechtenstein can choose to secede and join Switzerland or join Austria or just become independent if they want to. And the most recent political reform that they did in Liechtenstein is around 2004 or so. It's one of the very few countries in the world where the executive had more power. You had political reform wherein they reduced the power of parliament and the king and the prince got more power, but it, it comes with the right to self-determination self and secession. So I think this is one way in which we could see an alternative model to the American model of let's all get together, write a constitution, and then all of our kids are bound by this thing for centuries, and they must all go by it, and we must all abide by it. And if you don't like what they're doing to you, you know, just vote harder until you get to be in power and then you get to do it to them. It's an alternative perspective, but I think it's very much worth considering. I I think it's, you know, it, it's it's how anything gets done in the private sector. So the, my, my favorite example of this is the reason the iPhone works is not because there's a democracy where iPhone users get to get together and write a constitution and elect uh, Congress members who go into Apple and tell uh, and, and hold, you know, Tim uh, Cook to account and have checks and balances on him. The reason that Apple works is that you simply can decide to not buy it if you don't like it. And so the fact that you can just choose to not use Apple, for me, is more valuable than a million committees and a million votes and a million power sharing agreements with the CEO. I'd rather have companies have the freedom to do whatever they want, and I have the freedom to choose or, or reject their products. And I think if we continue in the process of which we've been mentioning happening in Britain, you know, as we develop, as we become more civilized, as we engage more in market economies, we become more capitalist, become more classically liberal, more libertarian, I would imagine this would be the role that government would take in a world like this, that it's becoming, you know, people will opt out of the model of I'm going to vote harder until I get into power and then I get to impose my views on others. And they're going to opt into the model of I'm just going to go to where the CEO manages to run the country properly or my local community is going to secede from this part of government to the other one. Well, I mean, I think if you interpreted your ideas, is the world be better if everybody had the freedom to move to the country that they most they most supported, right? It's like a global mobility idea, then maybe assuming people could, could move. If you interpreted it as people have the ability to save their wealth in Bitcoin, then I like that idea. <laughs> like move your property to Bitcoin. The the challenge I see is if if you give the mayor of a small city in Kansas the ability to succeed and he's on the superhighway and they succeed and then they put up a toll booth and they charge everybody $200 every time they cross a 100 meter stretch of highway, then you're going to have like lots of petty, you know, wars, right? Like uh, You're just going to have another highway built around it. Yeah, you have another meters. highway. <laughs> no. Yeah. Like, like that, I mean... What you're saying there is is someone that happens to be uh, in a in a small municipality with a bridge that was built a hundred years ago has the ability to extort money out of everyone that crosses the bridge unless they want to spend twenty billion dollars to build their own bridge again. And so you're just inviting some petty extortion at the local level uh, over and over again. I mean that could be a disaster. You you could get that on the short. On the short term, but I, I do think uh, both theory. What are you going to do if 20,000 cities all succeed at the same time and everybody basically charges you $10,000 to cross their city limits, right? 
Well, there's going to be the incentive for cities to go to cut the undercut, right? That's why cartels don't work on the free market. It's if one business, you know, the group of businesses. No, because there's 10,000 cities on a highway. So each one of them can exact a toll. Oh, you're see. talking about like on a on a constant highway. I mean, you you could see that, and then they could exact a toll, and then they're not going to get any revenue, and then they're going to be very poor. I think I think the incentive is like not until after they've choked the entire economy and plunged the country into civil war. So I think you should, I I think you could be enthusiastic about this idea. But if every single city had the ability to succeed from the state and from the union, then you would have chaos. And then you'll have like all sorts of local demagogues that are all, that are all basically jostling each other for power to extort or blackmail everybody else in the country, right? doesn't make any the, sense. The world would be a lot better if we had a 10,000 little micro Stalins than if we have one Stalin. Because 10,000 little micro Stalins as little chiefs of their fiefdom. Well, let's take this to the extreme. What if the guy that runs LaGuardia Airport just decides to form his own city and succeeds and shuts down the airport. You go to Newark. <laughs> like, that's better? Yeah. Is that better? And for his family, right? <laughs> that's obviously very bad business for the airport. Yeah. No, not really. Like, there's three guys that take over Kennedy, LaGuardia, you know? You, you could look at the, his, the history of, of these types of pressures. Same thing with railroads, right? We go to, like, the railroads after the Civil War, and there was constant undercheating, uh, they try to form pools and they would they would break up in the fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty. Rothbard goes through how a lot of people said the article suffered from each state was like its own little fiefdom, charging an arm and a leg tariffs and all of that. But that's not what happened. There was an incentive. Basically, other states would lower their tariffs. There would be smuggling. And no, what happened was the Interstate Commerce Act, right? Well, there was like no the only reason that you can actually you can actually trade is because because we put in place rules to prevent states from abusing other states. Well, so that was that gets into the Constitution. And Rothbard talks about this. The Interstate Commerce Clause was a little bit different because the main motive of the protectionists was that they're saying we're not able to get the protection we want uh, against Great Britain. So what we need to do is take the power away from the states and put it in one monopoly system, basically the U S government. And by the like, 10 years later, charged 30% tariff. So you, 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 it wasn't the, the interstate commerce clause was, was not sort of the free market clause. A lot of people w would say it was really the, the competing system under the articles it actually did work quite well. It's just okay, that, well, I, th I think yeah. this is outside the scope of conceived in liberty, but for the record, <laughs> I'm against I, I'm against everybody in the world being able to create their own country. Like I don't know why the mayor that got elected for 12 months ought to be able to create his own country in the 12 months. That just sounds like more fiat government to me. <laughs> Right. Why should 10,000 people in the U.S. be able to create their own country and impose it on everybody in the city that they live in? Right. That, I don't think that that's better. Right. Well, I think Rothbard in Conceived in Liberty was talking about self-determination and really sort of the logical process of secession. Right. Seceding, which breaking away is the ultimately ability where it's like everyone in a sense would self-determine. Would a mayor who gets elected, would he be able to break away? I mean, there would have to be probably some sort of referendum on that. But having that competition, I think, like it, when these governments are linked informally through, say, a confederation or something, or even just a, a, decentralized. A subject for another podcast, I think. We could talk about it for two hours, but I, I think that it's distracting from- Subject for Conceived in Liberty, Volume 5, right? The question yeah. of Conceived in Liberty. I should add, right. um, Patrick's uh, yeah. authored a book on cronyism in America, so he's, he's an expert on this topic. So maybe we should have another top, another discussion of this. But I think the viewpoint, if I were to sort of summarize the uh, Rothbardian slash Prince Hans Adam perspective here, is that the reason uh, y you could make such assumptions as like the one that you made about any kind of market good, you know, Apple and Samsung are going to monopolize phones and now they're only going to sell us mobile phones for a million dollars. Why won't they do it? Well, because anybody can start a phone company and can undercut them. And so they have to always stay on their toes. And it's the same for pretty much anything else. Yeah, I, I don't agree with you on that. I actually think that we're they're becoming common carriers. Right. Like at some point, if both Google and Apple deny you an account, you know, uh, you can't really participate in the civilization anymore. And if you get if you get cut off from Google, Apple and Microsoft, it's hard for you to participate. So 
So I liken it more like to someone that provides electricity in New York City. You literally can't live a life without water and electricity. And so if there's a power company and a water company, they're a common carrier. And, you know, your civil rights ought to include that they can't cut off your water and cut off your electricity because they disagree with you or because you don't. And they shouldn't be able to. Ultimately, common carriers don't get to monopolize the, or set the price either, right? Because if, if the water company could set the price, the richest people in the world would be whoever controlled the water supply for New York because they would charge you $200 a day to drink a cup of water. But then that, was, that would just bankrupt New York and people would leave and New York wouldn't function as a city anymore because why would you no, do that's that? Not, that's not true. They would be the richest people in the world because they would just raise it to the point where everybody had to pay because the cost to, you, the cost to rebuild New York City is hundreds of trillions of dollars. So obviously, if I get a monopoly on the air in New York City or the power in New York City or the water in New York City, or if I get to charge for the crossing one of the bridges in New York City and I've got an unregulated monopoly, then I can simply uh, extort everybody else in the society for as much as I want. And so, I don't believe that's the case. I believe you just destroy the city. And we're watching that happen to places like San Francisco and L.A. They didn't get this drastic in the measures that they're doing, but they are destroying these th cities. This is why – but this is why the city – if you were the mayor of New York City and the guy that controlled the water supply jacked the cost of water to $1,000 a day, your choice is watch the city die or pass a law saying you can't charge people 1,000x the cost of producing the water – or just right. don't stop people from competing with them. See, the thing is, these things, I, th I think the way that it happens is they, the, the, you know, they manufacture this scenario where we need to pass this law to prevent the guy from charging $1,000. And so we need to have a committee that decides who gets to sell water and for how much. And then that ends up being how you end up with a water monopoly under the pretext of protecting you from the $1,000. You see, the, so what you have to fear is the government body that has no competition that can impose who can buy and who sell not the water seller who can just be uh, undercut by any competitor because anybody could drive in trucks with water. Yeah, this it's, is not, what they it's do. not practical to run 14 different power companies to every single building, right? And it's not practical to have 14 bridges in competition when there's a right-of-way for one. That's why you only end up with a, f with a small number of them, but only the ones that don't do this nasty thing. And if they ever do engage in this nasty thing, they, well, they're quickly driven out. Yeah, so my point is I really do think that the modern society, you know, is based upon having common carrier rights. For the civilization to work, you need, you need right, civil rights. And so if, if I deprive you of your civil rights, then that just means that the telephone company can cut you off when they disagree with your politics or the power company can just turn off your power. And so I, I do think that civil rights and a bill of rights ought to apply to common carriers when someone has a natural monopoly, whatever it is. Looking at the history of, say, water companies or electricity companies in the United States. And by the way, if I gave you $100 billion, you can't rebuild Apple computer in the next decade. If I gave you a trillion dollars, it's likely you can't rebuild Apple computer in the next decade. So it's not like if I cut you off, you'll just find another provider. There really is a, a small number of providers. The same is true. I could give you a trillion dollars and say rebuild Microsoft. You can't rebuild Microsoft in the next five years with a trillion dollars. So they, they are really natural monopolies that we rely upon for civilization to move forward. So I think saying that they can cut off anybody or they can charge anybody any amount of money is a very dangerous thing to think because you're all of a sudden installing a set of oligarchs that have the power of life or death over everybody else. And they can all, in essence, just extort and, and, and control the entire population. You might as well just put them in charge of the kingdom. I mean, I think looking at the, the one, the, the history of so-called natural monopolies, whether railroads or roads or water or electricity, there was a lot of competition. And I mean, we, we could always get into something's a new, a new monopoly, you know, like New York City. Can you rebuild New York City? Yeah, it would take a long, long time. Are we seeing sort of New York City change? There's certainly competition. People are leaving New York City uh, going to Tampa, going to Texas, et cetera. So, I mean, this is a co question of competition. And I, I know we, you know, we're kind of, we, we could talk a, a lot about this, but the subject of natural monopoly is a, 
is a fascinating one in economics or common carriers. And, and I think Safedine and I, we, we're, we're, we're very big on competition and the idea of the organic bottom up way to solve these problems of water scarcity or, or electricity or, or things like that. And I think, you know, economic theory and just empirical illustrations of this provide a very convincing example, but maybe, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to talk about it later. I mean, the point, yeah, I mean, it's a long discussion, but the point is you also believe in civil rights. So if you get trapped in a hotel and I just turn off the power and then I cut you off and starve you to death, right? <laughs> Are you going to argue that, well, competition will fix this after my death? Someone will create a hotel that doesn't starve people to death? Or will you say that you kind of have a civil right to life? to use the elevator to get out of the hotel and they can't cut off your oxygen, right? So at some point, if you, if you take this to the extreme, you're, you're defending all of the big tech platforms that just cut off and censor everyone whose message they disagree with. I think the issue here is that with, with the issue of tech, the reason Microsoft is such a blight and cancer on humanity is because of intellectual property laws granting them all of these monopolies. If this cancer was not allowed to grow because of intellectual property laws, we'd have an amazing ecosystem of open source operating systems all over the world. Bill Gates wouldn't be out there um, worth hundreds of billions of dollars experimenting with uh, making profit and killing people with uh, untried therapies and just basically being unleashed in the world with all of his uh, crazy ideas. We'd have a very different world if we didn't have this. So the problem, I think, all, if you really want to find these examples of common carriers or whatever it is abusing their position, you will always find state privilege at the source. They get away with it because of state privilege. Microsoft throws people in jail if they copy their files. And that's where, where they get their privilege from. If you just force them to have a business model that doesn't allow them to throw people in jail, they'd behave very differently. And we'd be far less reliant on them. And I got to say, even today, I don't use Microsoft. I don't use Apple. You don't need those things. There are open source alternatives out there that are for me, for, for my purposes, infinitely better than Microsoft. I, when I use Microsoft's services, I feel like I'm watching cable TV. It's just they're constantly trying to sell me stuff. They're constantly trying to get, grab my attention and interrupt me with all of their uh, marketing. And I prefer open source things. So it, is, it isn't that hopeless. I've managed to publish books and publish podcasts and run a website. And I don't use Apple or Microsoft. Our time's up. <laughs> <laughs> It's, you need hours and hours and you need to organize to have a, for us to have a constructive discussion on, on right. utilitarian entitlements. And, you know, we can, we can debate whether the Romans should have run aqueducts and given the plebs water for free or whether they should have charged them and how much they should have charged them and who should have owned the water concession. And we can debate, you know, whether roads should be public or private. And we can debate whether ports should be open and closed and, and the like, but that's, but I don't know that we would disagree if we framed the discussion properly. <laughs> and, and so yeah. we need more time and a more, a more interesting framing for there to be anything constructive to come from that. Should we do another discussion on cronyism in America with Patrick's uh, new book? If, if you like. Uh, definitely. I'd definitely be up for it. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's keep this show going. We'll, okay. uh, we'll schedule a third one. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me today. Awesome. Thank you for coming, Michael. I, this was great. We should, uh, I think we should just end just pointing out Conceived in Liberty is a good book. You should read yeah. the book. It's, uh, it's, it's full of thousands and thousands and thousands of interesting insights from history. It'll, it'll help you understand where we came from. It'll help you understand why the American Republic was formed the way it was. You know, uh, it'll it'll help you in deciding where you want to take your own life or your own company or your own systems going forward. I think there's a lot of insight for the crypto economy. There's a lot of insight for how to design a crypto asset. A lot of insights that show you why Bitcoin's a good idea, <laughs> right? You you definitely come away appreciating a lot of the wisdom of Satoshi if you study it. I think you appreciate the struggle of humanity in order to create a fair and equitable and uh, efficient system. 
you can see the experimental process by which we went through to get there. Uh, but, but I think, you know, as a general rule, Rothbard doesn't really cut many corners. And if you read the entire book and, and you read about the, the never ending struggle of the plebs versus the aristocrats of one people versus other people and one group versus another group and one, you know, one nation versus another nation and one ideology versus another ideology. You know, you're left with the thought that the human spirit is always uplifting, always attempting to achieve some kind of excellence and struggling against adversity. I, I think it will give you an appreciation for the time we live in today. It'll make you appreciate the challenges we have. And you realize even when we think things are bad, you know, they're, they're not nearly so bad compared to the adversity that all of these colonists went through. The French, the Spaniards, the British, everybody, the Indians, the adversity they faced is, is off the charts compared to what we deal with today. So I think, I think it's really a, a constructive book and it's morally uplifting and, uh, and it'll give you humility and hopefully some wisdom and insight as to how to move forward in the most prosperous fashion. I completely agree. It's, 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 it's a great book and it's a, it's a great read. You should read Rothbard's Conceived in Liberty and you should read Rothbard's other books. Uh, I highly, highly recommend Murray Rothbard. Likewise, I cannot recommend Rothbard enough. I'll just end with a small thing, a small productivity hack that I use in life. Every time I want to read something, I pass it through the Rothbard test. I remind myself that there's an enormous amount of Rothbard's work out there that I haven't read yet. And I ask myself, is this better than reading Rothbard or not? And the answer is usually not. And it's extremely productive because most of the stuff that's on the internet that's vying for your attention is not as uh, worthwhile as a Rothbard book, which you can access for free from Mises.org. So yeah, and speaking of which, Conceived in Liberty is available for free uh, for download from Mises.org. All four, all, all five volumes, you can find them on Mises.org, as well as the vast majority, if not all, of Rothbard's work. Uh, so I highly recommend Mises.org as a resource for getting all of your Austrian economics fix. Patrick and Michael, thank you so much again for this. I really enjoyed it a lot, and I'm sure that our listeners will enjoy it too. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers.